Ah, gotta love this time of year. Scorching sun, beautiful beaches, chirping cicadas, flesh-eating zombies. Wait, no, not that. Dead Island is such an odd series. When it comes to discussions about it, usually it's not about the game's individual merits, but things surrounding it. Like the beautiful trailer of a poor family being killed by zombies, the controversy of Riptide's Collector's Edition that offered a plastic human torso. Not gonna lie, I low-key would buy that. Or the fact that the game's sequel is the current poster boy for development hell and potential vaporware. But the original Dead Island game doesn't really get talked about much these days. Is it a hidden gem overshadowed by more recent zombie games? Or a forgettable lackluster experience? Well, let's find out. Dead Island is a first-person survival horror game set in a semi-open world. Your playable characters are staying on the fictional tropical island of Banoi, which is located off the coast of Papua New Guinea. They're all there for different reasons, either working, performing, or drowning their sorrows on vacation. Whatever their reasons for being on the island, it's not long before their time in paradise is ruined by a zombie outbreak. They'll now have to survive the legions of the walking dead, help fellow survivors, figure out what caused the outbreak in the first place, and finally find a way out of there. While its story is standard zombie fare, I have to give the game props for its unique setting. Up to this point, most zombie games were primarily set at night. In a big spooky mansion, a ruined city, or some science lab. But having it set on a tropical island almost exclusively during the day was a breath of fresh air in the zombie genre when it first released. And I have to say, the game's visuals really hold up and it looks absolutely gorgeous. The sand, the palm trees, and the sparkling water contrast well with all the blood and death around you. And despite being mostly set during the day, the game is great in creating tense moments and anxiety. As you can often hear zombies shambling around far off out of sight, or see their supposed dead bodies littering the ground, giving you pause before running down certain areas. And there's tons of foliage and debris that zombies can hide behind, so you won't always see them coming. The game can be played either alone or in co-op with up to four players. And since I didn't have any friends who owned the PC version, and didn't want to gamble playing with a rando, I played the game by myself. Which thankfully isn't too hard, but can be a bit tougher in certain spots depending on which character you're using. You'll have a choice between four different characters, each one representing a different character class. The first is the rapper Sam B, a one-hit wonder who was hosting a concert on the island during the outbreak. He serves as the group's tank and specializes in blunt weapons, being able to take more damage than the others and doing higher damage with the most common weapon type. Next is Logan Carter, an ex-football player whose career went down the toilet after he killed someone during a hit and run. He serves as the jack of all trades for the group, specializing in throwing weapons as opposed to having a specific weapon type. This gives him a lot more utility and doesn't limit what weapons you can use with him for maximum damage. Next is Perna Jackson, an ex-police officer who now works as a private bodyguard for rich VIPs. She's the group's support character, specializing in firearms, doing more damage with shots along with lessening the recoil of weapons. Perna stands out more when you're playing as a group, as she has passive buffs that will increase the party's strength, can cause health regeneration, and even increase the durability of weapons. And finally, the character I chose for this run, Xion Mei a Chinese police officer undercover as a receptionist on Bonoi, in order to spy on rich westerners. She's the assassin of the group, being the fastest and dealing tons of damage with bladed weapons, along with being able to spec into doing more damage with status effects like bleed or poison. Her only drawback is that she's the squishiest of the playable characters, having the least health and taking more damage from stronger enemies. This makes her the toughest to use during a solo run. When playing and killing the undead, your characters will gain XP and eventually level up, allowing them to spend skill points on abilities. You have the option to spec into three different skill trees, Survival, Combat, and Fury. Survival focuses on passive buffs and abilities, like increasing your health, stamina, the ability to pick locks, or increase your inventory size. Combat focuses on buffing your character's weapon specialty, increasing critical damage, durability, duration of debuffs, 
and unlocking a head stop ability that lets you one shot down zombies. And finally, Fury focuses on buffing the character's Fury ability. While killing zombies, a small red circular gauge will fill up as you kill them, eventually letting you use a sort of rage mode that offers different abilities based on the character. Either buffing your damage to where you can one shot weaker enemies, giving you infinite ammo, or infinite throwables. Specking into this tree will increase the duration of Fury Mode, the damage you do in it, the XP you gain, and how quickly you build Fury. Overall, the characters are diverse and play differently enough from each other that they don't feel like superficial choices. And thanks to their skill trees, you have a lot of variety in how you want to customize and specialize them. It's just too bad that they're not well-written characters. Like, at all. Each one has their backstory narrated before choosing them, giving you some insight into who they were and what they did before the outbreak, but pretty much none of that comes to play throughout the game outside of explaining why they're so good at killing zombies. They say close to nothing throughout the game outside of some one-liners when killing zombies or discovering things. Normally, this wouldn't bug me, as Left 4 Dead and the Borderlands series do the same thing with their heroes. But the difference here is that Dead Island features cutscenes where we see our heroes talking to each other, and other survivors, reacting to the things that are happening and occasionally trying to make plans. But that's it for them. There's no depth to them, no character growth. You don't really get any kind of insight into what's going through their heads, or see any real relationship growing between the four heroes. They're just four people traveling together, and that's basically it. Borderlands avoids this issue by having cutscenes stay in first person, so we never see our playable Vault Hunter actually speaking to or interacting with others, just speaking the occasional lines of dialogue. This lets a player just project themselves onto their playable character as no one really important, like a customizable character in other games. Dead Island's heroes feel like the devs wanted to do something with them, but gave up halfway through. This problem ends up extending to the story, but I'll get to that later. Since I just went over our heroes, let's move on to the creatures they'll be killing all game, the zombies. Like more recent zombie media, there are several different types of zombies. You've got the standard slow moving zombies known as walkers, the most common type in the game and fairly easy to dispatch or run away from. Next are the infected, recently turned humans who haven't begun to decay yet. They move fast and hit hard, announcing their presence by screeching and taking a run at the player. They go down fast, but can be a nuisance in a group of zombies, can chase the player for quite a while, and can stunlock you if you get stuck fighting a few of them at once. The third type of zombie introduced are the thugs. Thugs are huge lumbering zombies that move even slower than the average walker. They serve as mini-bosses, usually placed near mission important objectives, doing a ton of damage and soaking up just as much. Thugs are best handled either by fighting long range, or with hit and run tactics, running in to hit them and backing off before they get a chance to swipe back. Next are the Suiciders. Suiciders are zombies covered in explosive boils, and tragically somewhat aware of their fate as they can be heard asking for help when near them. The bigger they are? They barely move faster than the average walker, and instead will blow themselves to bits when a player gets too close. Their explosion does heavy damage, and can outright one-shot you if you stand too close. Because of their appearance, it's usually pretty easy to spot them, letting you attack them safely from a distance, blowing them up and potentially killing any zombies surrounding them. Though, in later parts of the game, they do have an annoying habit of hiding behind walls and doors, possibly causing you to run into a nasty surprise if you're not careful. The next zombie type encountered are the Rams. Rams are similar to thugs, being bigger, stronger, and more durable zombies. They're bound by straitjackets, either because they were crazy before being infected, or being bound because they were infected. Kinda hard to tell, the game doesn't really explain it that well. Whatever the reason, they can't swing at you like regular zombies. Instead, they'll charge into you for tons of damage, along with throwing kicks. They can be pretty dangerous due to their speed and are usually flanked by other zombies easily one or two-shotting you if you're unlucky. Next are floaters, basically this game's equivalent to the boomers from Left 4 Dead. Big fat zombies who attack from afar by spitting sludge at the player. Due to being bloated with water, they're immune to poison and fire effects, but take more damage from electrified attacks. And finally, the final type of zombie are the butchers. 
Zombies that have somehow whittled their hands down to the bone, using them as blades to attack you. They're extremely dangerous, moving fast like the infected, dealing a high amount of damage, and even being able to dodge your melee attacks. Zombies aren't the only things you'll have to worry about though, as you'll also have to fight off other survivors. They're made up of gangs and prisoners who are taking advantage of the outbreak to loot and do whatever they want. They mainly attack with firearms, taking cover behind walls and other objects to shoot you. They're nowhere near as durable as the zombies, usually going down in just a couple melee swings, or instantly dying from headshots if you're using guns. They make up for this squishiness by attacking in large groups, spreading out far enough to shoot your character from different spots. So positioning yourself and picking them off one by one is the best approach, as you'll get shredded to pieces by gunfire if you run in recklessly. Now how are you going to handle all these foes? Well, with whatever you manage to find lying around. Weapons are pretty diverse in Dead Island, ranging from mundane things like boat oars, pipes, knives, or baseball bats, to more exotic weapons like katanas, brass knuckles, guns, or explosives. You can only carry and equip a few weapons at a time, but you can equip more as you level up. Most combat is made up of up-close melee encounters, smashing the weapon you're using into a zombie until they're dead again. Depending on what weapon you're using and where you're hitting an enemy, you can break a limb and stop them from attacking you, or hack it off and outright one-shot them if you manage to lop off their head or one of their legs. Weapons also come in different rarities like in RPGs, following the usual color coding, with white as common, green as uncommon, blue as rare, purple as epic, and orange as legendary. Though because of the different stats on weapons, along with weapons having level requirements, the rarities might as well not even exist as an epic level 2 hammer will be outclassed almost immediately by some random common weapon you'll find minutes later. It doesn't help that rarer weapons just have better stats, but not any extra effects like you see in games like Borderlands. To keep combat from being just smashing the attack button until the enemy is dead, there are some limitations put in place. First is that your characters have a stamina system that's used up when they sprint, kick a foe, or swing their weapon. So if you run out of stamina, you can be left defenseless and knocked down by a zombie. Second is that weapons have durability. While they won't shatter to bits like in Breath of the Wild, if you overuse a weapon and its durability hits zero, it pretty much loses all effectiveness and you might as well be hitting zombies with a pool noodle at this point. But if you get a sweet weapon you don't want to lose, you're in luck. Because this game has repair and crafting. Scattered all over the map in the various safe houses you unlock are workbenches. Here you can repair your weapons and upgrade their stats for the cost of cash, the price tag increasing with the rarity of the weapon, along with modifying them using various items you'll scavenge when exploring. In order to modify a weapon, you'll first have to find the blueprint for their mod. These are usually handed out by NPCs when completing a quest for them, but can also be found when exploring the world. Once you have the blueprints and the required items, you can modify weapons in various ways. From something as simple as attaching blades or nails to a bat to increase its damage, or let you cut off limbs as opposed to breaking them, to adding status effects to them, like shock that can stun an enemy, or fire that will ignite them for damage over time. Crafting will also let you create throwables like grenades or molotovs, along with ammunition for your firearms. Overall, the crafting system is fine. It won't let you make anything too over the top like in say Dead Rising 2, but it's simple enough to use with cash and materials easy enough to come by that it'll become second nature to use a workbench anytime you see one. And due to enemies scaling with your level, you won't be able to make anything too ridiculously overpowered. So the game maintains a bit of a challenge throughout. Along with smashing zombies to bits, you'll also be completing missions for various NPCs. They're divided into main story missions which work to advance the plot and move to the next chapter in the story to side missions, which are made up of the usual type of quests you see in open world games. Fetch quests that have you look for a certain amount of an item or a specific item, being sent out to fight a particular person, your standard escort quests that will need you to protect an NPC as you guide them somewhere, and small little story missions that usually can't be completed until reaching a certain act. Completed quests will give tons of XP along with the reward of cash, weapons, mods, or crafting material. They're fine for what they are, and even the potentially most frustrating ones, escort missions, tend to be a breeze. Depending on the NPC, they're either pretty good at defending themselves, or the scripted zombies will just ignore them to attack you. Now let's tackle Dead Island's story, 
or what it tries to pass off as a story. After choosing a character, they'll wake up in their hotel room, having seemingly blacked out from drinking the night before, having slept through the initial outbreak, which is kinda confusing, because if you watch the opening before the game starts, you'll see some faceless nobody wandering the island instead, interacting with the playable characters, stealing booze from Logan, getting up on stage with Sam B, getting flattened by Perna after groping her, and then running into the wrong bathroom and finding Xion with an injured woman, before he finally returns to his room to black out. I mean, the other characters could have done the same thing, but the outbreak was just getting started during the intro, with some of the characters close enough to where they would have noticed zombies popping up. Whatever, don't think about it too hard. After wandering around, a voice over the hotel's PA system will reach out to your character to offer assistance. He'll guide you through the hotel until you're spotted by the infected, outrunning them only to be knocked out by another infected. Welp, guess you're zombie chow. Or not, as after being attacked, your character will fade in and out of consciousness, spotting various people helping them and debating straight up killing them. However, your character will regain consciousness, but doesn't end up joining The Walking Dead. They'll wake up in a shack with a bunch of other survivors, the area being attacked by zombies, with only the lifeguard Cinemoid doing anything about it. You'll be thrust into helping him and the other survivors. Afterwards, the voice from before will reach out, explaining that help won't arrive, and instead they need to find a way to get to him so he can help them escape. His radio signal ends up dying before he can further elaborate. Talking to Cinemoy, he fills you in that the voice called him to go help you, claiming you have immunity to the virus. How the voice could have possibly known that isn't really explained properly, but my guess is after you were attacked, he noticed you didn't turn right away and just assumed as much. Lucky thing he was right and you didn't just end up turning later, or that the zombies didn't finish eating you by the time Cinemoy arrived. But this little plot point serves to explain why your characters are the only ones doing any kind of work to help. This is where Act 1 officially kicks off, with Cinemoy asking the heroes help in moving the survivors to the lifeguard tower which is much more secure. Most of Act 1 will be spent gathering resources for his group, trying to reach out to the voice, and exploring the beach resort and encounter other survivor groups. Towards the end of Act 1, Cinemoy says they don't have enough supplies to keep everyone fed. Which doesn't seem believable, as he only had a handful of survivors with him. And my character is constantly dropping stuff off. The way he talks makes it sound like quite a bit of time has passed in their safe zone, but there's no in-game clock indicating how much time has passed, or some kind of day and night cycle either, so it comes off more like they're blowing through supplies insanely fast. Cinemoy will ask you to first get a truck from the hotel parking lot, and then get it tricked out with armor so it can survive driving through the Walking Dead. Once both objectives are complete, it'll shift to Act 2 and a new area, the city of Moresby. The city is filled with the walking dead, and gangs looting everything, with a group of punks having taken complete control of the police station and warning others to stay away. Remember this for later. Despite Cinemoy having asked you to head to the city to search for more supplies, you'll instead spend most of this act helping a church full of survivors led by a nun named Mother Helen. Moresby is a really frustrating area to travel around. First, it's too big for its own good which you think would be fixed with driving a vehicle around, but nope. Lots of streets are blocked by debris and barriers, so if you find a car, you're not getting far before you have to hoof it on foot. Survivor camps are scattered far from each other, and not all of them have a fast travel point to let you easily jump between them. Also, the map acts kind of wonky here, as there are certain quests and NPCs who won't show up on the main Moresby map, as they'll be inside of instanced buildings considered separate from the map. This can make turning in certain quests annoying if you forgot where the NPC was. And while zombies can be easily avoided by just jumping on a car and picking them off, if you end up dying, most likely to a suicider or a ram you didn't notice, the checkpoint system will pretty much always spawn you in front of more zombies, which means getting attacked as soon as you spawn. Though the game does give you a temporary buff of health to help mitigate this. At the end of Act 2, you'll finally return to the lighthouse to drop off supplies, and Cinemoy will tell you that they're still trying to reach the voice on the radio, asking you to head to the hotel where some of his group were trying to use the building's radio. Reaching the hotel roof, you'll call the voice and finally find out who he is. He claims to be Ryder White, 
a colonel in the Benoit Island Defense Force. White still offers to help them off the island, but their armored truck won't reach him, as he's actually in a prison on an island off the coast, surrounded by sea mines. The group questions if he is who he says he is, as it seems strange that someone like him couldn't get help from his own people to escape. He waves it off and explains that a monsoon off the coast has made it impossible to reach his forces, and that he's unwilling to abandon his wife, who was injured while working at the prison. Skeptical, the group trusts him for now, taking his advice and searching for a smuggler named Moen, who's located somewhere in the jungle. This takes us into Act 3. After several hours of helping the locals, you'll eventually find Moen in a swamp, but instead of taking you to the prison, he instead offers to take you to the source of the outbreak, a secret research lab out in the jungle. While there, you'll meet Dr. West, who will fill you in on the origins of the virus. It's a mutated strain of Kuru, which is a real disease. It's a neurodegenerative disorder that was common to the foray people of Papua New Guinea. I'm grossly oversimplifying it, but essentially the disease would spread among the tribe as they would eat and consume the bodies of their dead, a ritual they didn't believe they were freeing their spirits. Kuru would slowly cause loss of motor functions, the loss of speech and awareness, and soon being unable to eat, more or less living zombies. Apparently, the scientists were studying the natives and the origins of Kuru, and ended up spreading a mutant strain that caused the outbreak. Dr. West also hypothesizes the reason your heroes are all immune is because you share the same blood type, O negative. He'll ask you to help him and the other scientists in developing a cure, needing you to get blood samples from the natives, and eventually find a native who is exposed to the disease but hasn't turned, this being a girl named Yerima. Naturally, things go south, though it all happens off-screen. When you return to the lab, you'll find all the scientists turned and Yerima having locked herself up for protection. According to her, the doctor was trying to bleed her dry, so she tried to run and somehow the zombie subjects in the lab broke loose. Not all is lost though, as he did manage to make one dose of the cure, one that the voice on the radio begs you to bring to him on the island. This is the point of no return for the game. So if you didn't finish up your side quests, now's the time to do so. Heading to the prison island, you'll enter the final act. There's nothing to this place. Really, it's just a bunch of fetch quests to pad out the runtime before the ending. You'll finally be on your way to meet White in person, but he betrays your team and steals the cure for himself. An inmate named Kevin who you befriended during this act claims that White lied about getting everyone off the island, and has in fact ordered a nuke to take out the island. Confronting White on the rooftop, he assures everyone he'll take the cure to the mainland and have it mass-produced, still desperate to cure his zombified wife. But after his wife is set loose on him and he ends up getting bitten, he's forced to use the cure on himself. Instead of curing him though, he turns into a super zombie, becoming the final boss of the game. Once he's dead, the heroes will all board a helicopter to escape. Radio broadcasts from the military claiming the island is still in quarantine and that aid is on the way. Nothing is mentioned about the nuke, and as the group leaves the island, it's still very much intact. Before the credits roll, our new friend Kevin gives us a sinister smile, staring at Yerima, clearly planning something. And that's Dead Island. Christ, this story is an absolute mess to unpack. The game's main story progresses at a snail's pace, with hours going by between main quests before something happens. With only the completion of some main missions offering a cutscene, but most just give you a blink and miss it prompt that a chapter has been completed. Most of the main missions don't really play into each other either, usually just busy work until the story moves forward. The NPCs do little to move the plot themselves, they have little or no character development. Having no investment in the plot outside of just being another leader of a group of survivors. With close to nothing happening to them outside of their interactions with the player character. The best some get is when they call you on the radio to tell you what's been happening while you are gone, bizarrely with way more interesting things happening off screen than you see unfold on screen. For example, Cinemoy will call while you're in Moresby, letting you know that the paranoia and starvation is starting to tear his group apart. He tells you about a young girl in the group who is sick and running a fever. No one is sure if she's actually infected or not, but the threat she presents and the group's desperation ends with the girl being killed something that fills Cinemoy with a massive amount of guilt. 
And wouldn't that have been way more interesting to see up close for yourself? Maybe have your group of survivors involved to try and save the girl? Especially since the exact same scenario played out with them? Sinemoy sounds completely destroyed by the whole experience, but if you return to him later, he's still in the same spot as if nothing ever happened. Then there's the plot holes and inconsistencies with regards to the voice, aka Ryder White. Well, I was going to get into that, but the devs released DLC to fill in the blanks and answer questions left hanging during the main story. The story DLC for Ryder White has you play as the Colonel and see things from his perspective. After crash landing on Benoit when one of his men ends up infected, he has to rush through the streets of Moresby to survive. First blowing up a bridge, and then getting to the prison to save his wife that's been infected. His campaign focuses more on gunplay, holding the line and spraying down hordes with turret fire. He'll eventually make contact with Kevin, the guy who showed up at the end of the main story. But as it turns out, Kevin is actually Charon, a super hacker criminal who was briefly mentioned during the main game. And he's the mastermind behind everything that takes place in the game, minus the initial outbreak. He was the one contacting the group all game, impersonating White so he would come off as more trustworthy. He's also behind what happened at the science lab, as he asked Dr. West to create a super virus, and not an antidote like the heroes thought. During the DLC, he plays White like a fiddle as well, manipulating him with the promise of saving his wife, getting him to set up the gas trap that would be used on the survivors later. While White wakes up and sees what Sharon is up to towards the end, he fails to kill the hacker. And more importantly, he never tries to tell the survivors that Charon was playing them too, leading to his eventual transformation and death. But even with the reveal that the voice wasn't who he claimed to be, the twist still rings a bit hollow. I'm not entirely convinced the dev team had this planned out from the start, as outside that sinister smile at the end of the game, nothing during the main story really points to Kevin being anything more than another generic NPC. And really, it just goes to show how badly written and unfocused the story is, coming off as unimportant and almost tacked on. To really illustrate this point, we need to talk about one more thing. We need to talk about Jin. So this is going to be a bit of a touchy subject. I've never had to do this in my videos, but considering the subject matter and how terribly the story portrays it, I think it's appropriate to drop a warning here. If you're uncomfortable with the subject of sexual assault and rape, go ahead and skip to the time listed here. Alright, here we go. Jin is a minor character who is introduced near the end of Chapter 1, her dad being the mechanic who helped reinforce the group's truck. Her father was bitten before the group met them, his dying wish before he turned being that the group take Jin off the island. They agree and she tags along on their journey, but doesn't actually do much of anything. She can be used as extra storage for your weapons, but that's about it. Jin can be seen sitting around in survival camps, but rarely, if ever, offers anything to say. That is until we get towards the end of Act 2. The main group are eager to cut their losses and get off Benoit to find the voice. However, Jin gives them pushback, insisting they need to get supplies for the various survival camps, or else he'll run off with the armored truck if they don't comply. She makes a case to help all groups. This includes the survivors back at the lifeguard station, the church, and the police station. Now, all throughout Act 2, you'll hear criminals over the radio, constantly bragging that they took over the police station and warning others to stay away or die. Just about everyone warns Jin that the crooks at the police station aren't to be trusted, and should be avoided at all cost. Despite having no reason to, she decides against that advice. And predictably, the criminals take advantage of her generosity, kidnapping her and doing much, much worse. Your group will eventually storm the police station to save her, and she's not in a good state. The game isn't explicit about it, and I'll be honest, it flew over my head the first time I played the game over a decade ago. But the way Sheehan and Perna rush to Jin and shoo out Sambi and Logan make it obvious that the poor girl was most likely raped. The thing is, though, it adds absolutely nothing to the story. It's barely referenced and the game blames Jin for it almost immediately after it happens, with Sam B actively blaming her for it. After this, Jin's personality kind of flip-flops, from acting like her normal, helpful self one minute when we assist a group of villagers she knows, 
to acting cold and detached the next minute when the group discusses saving others, to breaking down and crying when she decides to return to her father's mechanic shop and put him down for good. But this doesn't come off as someone suffering from PTSD from rape. It just feels like the developers forgot it even happened. Only vaguely remembering here and there, probably the worst example being during the prison section. She and Yerima are being held as insurance so the group will work for the guy running the prison. His fellow inmates very loudly make it clear what they want to do to Jin and the other female characters. Here she's very obviously suffering from PTSD throughout the whole act. A frightened mess who begs the group to leave the prison. Like seriously, what the fuck? Who thought it was a good idea to leave a rape victim with a bunch of prisoners? This all comes to an end on the rooftop, with Jin suicidally baiting White, releasing his infected wife before he shoots and kills the poor girl. The scene tries to be sad and dramatic with some sad music and a slow motion shot of Jin falling as she dies, but it doesn't mean anything. The characters don't react or say anything about Jin after leaving, other than that one scene when they initially find her, none of the characters really do anything to help or comfort her. Her trauma isn't addressed at all, and is only brought back for dramatic moments. Like I said, like someone suddenly remembered it happened to her. Her being assaulted basically exists for shock value and nothing else. She could be cut from the story and everything would have played out exactly the same. Which makes the painful writing impossible to ignore. Honestly, it would have been better with no story than the mess they chose to go with. To sum up my thoughts on Dead Island, it's an extremely mixed bag of a game. Not terrible, but not outright spectacular either. The core gameplay is fun, being able to hack up zombies with some really nice gore effects, with a difficulty curve that feels balanced thanks to the scaling level of the zombies. And while the game does a good job to where you can comfortably play solo or with a group, Certain sections, like the final boss for example, feel like they were mostly designed around multiple players. It has a crafting system that, while easy to use, is overly simple and doesn't offer much outside of buffing your weapons with status effects, and not allowing you to switch mods on weapons, most likely making you think twice before using a more resource-heavy mod, and waiting until you get a much better weapon. I wouldn't call the skill trees deep, but they're effective and simple enough where you can see your character improve and it doesn't feel overly bloated with branching paths and pointless skills. The hub is probably one of the best from its generation. Being scaled back and unintrusive, no quest markers or other icons clutter the screen, just the important stuff like your health, weapon, and compass, really letting you take in your surroundings. I also like that you have to go and explore the map to uncover it, as opposed to climbing some big tower that ends up revealing a bunch of quests. The game's world is gorgeous with diverse enough areas that it doesn't feel like you're running through the same places over and over again. However, some might be too big and clunky for their own good. Specifically Moresby and the jungle. Moresby being awkward and slow to get around in. And the jungle is just way too big, most of it remaining unexplored unless you're hunting down side quests. Feels like it should have been combined with the lab area, which had a much smaller map. I think the resort area found the right balance being decently sized, having groups decently spread out well from each other, cars to get you around rather easily, and areas where you can't drive are comfortable and easy enough to maneuver on foot. All these gameplay elements feel fine, but not particularly impressive, like lesser versions of what other games had done at the time. The real problem with the game is its story, distractingly so. Like I said before, it's told extremely poorly, with only a handful of cutscenes, Ones that look really awful thanks to the terrible facial animations of the characters. They're stiff and have no emotion behind them, so it's impossible to take more dramatic scenes seriously at all. Human enemies you encounter are really just fodder with names. None of them get cutscenes to introduce them or flesh them out. So every enemy group encountered is interchangeable with another, as their main goal is to kill you and that's it. The game was structured more like Left 4 Dead or told its story like Borderlands, it would have worked a lot better, keeping it simple and out of the way of the combat. But it doesn't work here because the devs tried to do something, then just gave up halfway. It's impossible to ignore unless you just skip the cutscenes. Which may be the best way to play the game honestly, as you're not really missing much. Dead Island is a hot mess of a game. It feels like it was rushed during development, 
which might explain the janky story and half-baked ideas. For its faults, we can commend Dead Island for two things. First, the absolute banger of a track, Who Do You Voodoo Bitch? Seriously, I absolutely love this beat. And second, the eventual creation of Dying Light. After Techland and their publisher Deep Silver split up due to the ownership rights of the game, Techland said screw it, we'll make our own Dead Island, but with parkour and grappling. Dying Light built upon everything from Dead Island, with better combat, better writing, better characters, and an amazing night and day system, with sections that are absolutely terrifying and nerve-wracking. But who knows, with almost a decade of development, maybe Dead Island 2 will finally release to surprise us all. Fixing all the problems from the first game, and transforming it into something better with its own identity, instead of a mishmash of ideas from other games. Or maybe this series should just stay dead in the water. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. This one took so much longer to finish than I wanted to. A combination of the heat, getting sick, and going on vacation delayed it by a few weeks. But everything's back to normal now, so hopefully I can release a few more videos before the end of summer. Also, as you saw throughout this video, this was the debut of my updated avatar, Fuzzy. I've been wanting to incorporate something like this for ages, using a puppet to give more visual flair to my videos while I speak. So I'm hoping you guys liked it. Special thanks to Plagueburb on Twitter for helping me with the design and poses, along with JG Draw for the custom summer version. I don't really know what to do for my next video if I'm being honest. The GTA 4 videos left me seriously drained, and Dead Island was meant to be something more simple till I worked on something much bigger again, but the challenges in finishing this video made it just as draining. So I might do even something more shorter than the norm. The channel's second anniversary is around the corner, so thanks to everyone who's been with me the last two years. I wish I had something planned like last year, but unless a last second idea pops up, I probably won't be doing anything too special. Again, thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and comment with your thoughts. Did you play Dead Island back in the day? Do you think it still holds up? Or is it a mess of a game that, while fun, isn't really remarkable? Let me know what you think. Also, if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. I'm hoping to reach a thousand subs by the end of the year, and I'm more than halfway there. So any support would greatly be appreciated. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.